God aften og velkommen i Nordens Hus til dette arrangement. En uh, video samtale med Sofie Oksanen. And uh, good evening and welcome to the Nordic House in the Faroe Islands. So this conversation via via uh, video with uh, Sofie Oksanen directly from Finland. Professor uh, Bergrud De Hansen will uh, interview Sophie, and I will uh, hand over the word to him. Thank you. Uh, welcome to you all, guests in the audience, and also you uh, who are listening online, um, onlookers on the streaming service. And a very warm uh, welcome to you, uh, Sophie Oksanen from Helsinki. Well, there you are. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here in the Nordic House in Torshavn. Well, I'm very happy to be here and I'm so sorry I cannot be there, you know, physically, but my heart is with you. Well, that's good. We would also prefer to have you here in, in person, but that will be another time, post-corona. Yes. <laughs> um, i will start by uh, introducing uh, you, Sophie Oxenen, a little bit to the audience, and, and you can um, correct me or, or add something later if I'm incorrect or completely wrong. Um, you were born and you live in Finland, and you are usually introduced as a Finnish-Estonian writer. You have published plays and essays and six novels, and your works are translated into at least 30 or 40 different languages, maybe more. To many people, at least here on the Faroe Islands, you are known as the Finnish writer who wrote the novel Purge. In Faroese, it's not translated into Faroese, but I think we will call it Ransan or Busterbeining in Faroese. Um, and you won the Nordic Literary Prize in 2010 for that novel and you have won several other uh, literary prizes throughout Europe since then. Um, I, Purge, I think, was your international breakthrough. You became known to the wider world with Purge. Um, and Purge is a novel about Estonia, for the most part, and the modern history of Estonia. To me, and probably to many others, it was as if the Nordic region was expanded to the east, when you won the Nordic Literary Prize, because suddenly there were new experiences, new ways of looking at the world that became a part of Nordic literature. Um, maybe we could start by um, your background. Could you say something about your background in, in relation to you, to your writing? Uh, well, uh, I'm half Estonian and half Finnish. Uh, my mother is Estonian and uh, that's why Estonian history uh, is something close to my heart. And, um, but uh, my writing language is Finnish, so I write my books in Finnish, which I think um, is also a tool for uh, distance um, when writing about the recent past, um, because you, know, you do need some sort of distance uh, to your writing always. So I think this has given me the opportunity to maintain the certain distance to my subject as, as well. Um, and uh, well, my first novel, uh, Stalin's Cows, came out in Finnish 2003. And since that, I've been uh, only <laughs> writing. So um, I've always wanted to be an author. So this is my calling. Yes, because I, I mean, that is sort of the perspective in your novels. It's because it's Finnish and Estonian, you have sort of a double perspective uh, on everything. You see Estonia from the outside and, and you see Finland from the outside and you also see both the East and the West from the outside and the inside. You can sort of shift between two different uh, perspectives. Um, yes, I, I think being outside and inside at the same time is a very good perspective for an author or any artist. Uh, and um, because um, when you are too close to your subject, then you cannot have the distance that art requires. 
And yet at the same time, of course, you cannot be too distant to your subject because then, then it won't make a good book. No. <laughs> um, in, in several of your novels, as, as mentioned, we, we are sort of, as the readers are brought back into the history of Estonia in the 20th century. Uh, and what is special about them, I think, or fascinating, is the feature in your novels where you uh, connect the bigger history, the history of Estonia, the history of communism, the history of the Cold War. You connect that bigger history with the smaller or little history about individual people in, in Estonia and how they are influenced by um, the um, big events in, in, the, in politics, for instance. So, um, and also how it, behave, how it um, influences their behavior, their psychological well-being, their mental state and so forth. Can you say something about that relation that between the, the, the bigger history, the politics, the system, and then the behavior of individual people and, and, and the way they feel and act and talk and so forth? Uh, yes. Um, well, um I've always, um, f uh, I always uh, have believed in the power of art to change the world um, because um, when you think about the nonfiction and history books, which of course are very important for the background research, also for an author, but no one actually, want, that's not something you want to have uh, as a bedside uh, reading, uh, but a good novel works always, even for a person who's not interested in the uh, history of Estonia, for example. So um, this is what I had in mind uh, when I started to write my uh, first novel, uh, Stalin's Cows, which this, I think, I don't know if you can see the cover, is the uh, Danish edition. Uh, and um, I started to write it in 2001, I think, and at the time, uh, political climate was, of course, very different. Um, in, in that, I mean, I mean, we still um, there, there were still a lot of people who thought that Russia would be different. Russia would be like uh, any Western democracy, uh, in just uh, in an eye blink. But of course, it didn't happen. And Estonians did notice uh, the change in the political climate already at the time. Uh, and at the same time, I understood that people of my age, for example, didn't consider Soviet Union um, important at all anymore. Of course, because it didn't exist, but it did exist in certain islands of Soviet Union uh, for example, in Ukraine and, of course, in Russia as well. Um, and I thought that um, this is definitely something I need to write about uh, because if we cannot remember our past, we cannot understand what's coming or we don't understand our present either. So the problems were already there, but uh, Western, in many Western countries, people just didn't actually see them. And um, at the time, there were much more research already coming out, uh, lots of new information about the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, that, of course, was very interesting for an author. And um, what, what I had in mind was that I wanted to offer a perspective of an individual, especially women's, um, and um, through that perspective, you could actually, you know, uh, show the whole history. And uh, the, of course, the history of Estonia is super interesting uh, in that way that uh, one person can actually tell the story of three occupations and two uh, uh, periods of independency. Uh, so uh, that's why I wanted uh, the um, protagonist of Perch, this is the Danish edition as well, yeah. I wanted her to be an old person and that's why the story is taking place in 1992. Uh, when Estonia just regained uh, their independency. But the main character, Alire, is old enough to remember the uh, three different uh, periods of occupation, two Soviet occupation and one German occupation, uh, and then also the First Republic of Estonia. So um, uh, it's possible to tell uh, through one person so many different uh, 
so many different stories and the whole uh, huge period of, of different occupations and um, and that of course makes makes Estonian history also interesting for an author. I definitely think that you made Estonian history is interesting for many of us uh, through your novels and you mentioned Alite she has lived through the almost the entire history of his of Estonia, the 20th century of uh, Estonian history, uh, which makes her a very good uh, protagonist or, or main character. But you tend to, at least, to include um, two or three generations in your novels. Uh, and often, fe often uh, females, we have a young woman, then we have the mother, and then the grandmother, often. And then we see the history of Estonia through the perspective of um, three uh, women, different generations. Um, wh why is that? Can you say something about that? Why are you using that sort of technique or, or perspective? Uh, well, um, passing on the oral memory uh, is very important when it comes to uh, former Soviet uh, colonized countries, but also in, in um, other countries as well where uh, you cannot trust the official history. So um, in that kind of societies, oral memory is actually much more important than the official history and you need to rely on the oral memory. So this is where, um, this is one difference between the Eastern European countries and Western European countries because uh, in Nordic countries, when we go to the school, we can actually trust at least the main lines of the info, information and the perspectives we get from our education at school. Uh, but of course, during the occupation, um, there's no <laughs> uh, there's no information actually uh, about what had happened. So, uh, in that kind of societies and in those countries, uh, the oral memory and the oral, oral history is passed on from one generation to another. And this, of course, goes also to many other um, marginal uh, minorities as well. For example, in Native Americans in the States, they need to trust on their oral memory as well. So, um, so oral tradition is something where you need to have the uh, link of generations and this is also something that uh, matters now also when we talk about Russia and Russian politics because, of course, now they do have the uh, patriot, patriotic education system as well. But the, um, uh, when we think about the popularity of Soviet Union in Russia at present, then we have to also think about babushkas, the grandmothers who are passing on the nostalgic memories from the Soviet Union and Soviet times. So this is also uh, one way of keeping Soviet Union alive and passing on the information to uh, the next generation and making new memories as well. So in, in that way, um, when we talk about, for example, changing the world um, for better or for worse, then we have to remember the chain of generations uh, and um, and uh, that is um, that is also something that was very important for uh, Estonia uh, when you think about the uh, uh, Estonian identity and the language of course because the, the Russification meant that um, meant that um, so, uh, of course, the Estonian history uh, didn't exist in Soviet education, but also when you think about the language uh, and uh, Estonian identity is very much connected to the language, uh, Estonian language uh, and um, passing on also the knowledge about the language and the language itself had a huge meaning for the identity and also the, it was a form of passive resistance as well. So in that way, for the existence of the nation, the chain of generations was very important. And that is also what I'm, what I'm writing about. Yes, because uh, you mentioned um, Stalin's cows. 
Um, and the main character there, Anna, she actually remembers things from Estonia that she is too young to remember, or she is affected by things that have happened in Estonia before she was born, um, because she has this connection with her mother and, and her grandmother in, in Estonia, which is um, you know, very interesting and very um, well um, depicted in, in your novel. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if we if we uh, turn back to the main character in in Purge, Alite, she is she is really a, a fascinating person because she has been lived through all this and she has betrayed some people. She has actually been what you might call a sort of traitor, but she is also a hero. She has endured through a lot of opp oppression and and she has been isolated and so forth. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to say whether she is, you know, is she a victim of history or is she a perpetrator? Is she uh, loyal or is she a traitor? It's, it's very difficult to say. Uh, and it seems as if it's difficult to say in that novel, for a lot of people in that novel, whether they are loyal or traitors, it's as if the system has forced them to be something in between all the time. Um, can you say something on that? What are those, those mechanisms in, in that regime or society that put people in these uh, situations? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, occupation, um, like any occupation, is a very tricky system, um, like all totalitarian systems, because they are punishing you, but they are also punishing for the wrong, so-called wrong deeds, but they are also... Uh, offering you um, carrots, they are offering you uh, candy for behaving well. So in that way, this is a Pavlovian system um, where you have to find your way how to survive. And uh, of course, it's also a very opportunistic uh, system as well. And about opportunities, I wrote about in When the Doves Disappeared. This is not the Danish edition, I couldn't find it, but uh, there the main character is changing sides all the time, just, and just, you know, thinking not about the uh, survival of beloved ones, like Alide is thinking in uh, Perch, but um, in the Doves, the main character is m more like thinking about his own survival and his own um, benefits and, and what kind of prices uh, the system might have to offer. But um, the Soviet system, like any authoritarian or, or totalitarian system, um, is um, tricky in, in, a, in a way that uh, um, that everyday life requires some sort of uh, communication with the system. So if you wanted to um, um, wanted to have a nice job or education or uh, apartment, everything was connected to the system of uh, what kind of network did you have? And uh, it was, of course, very time consuming, but it was also um, a moral dilemma, uh, which uh, later on offered an excellent, uh, excellent uh, ground for the corruption as, as well. So um, it, it was pretty much, I think, impossible to be only good uh, in that system. Uh, and I think Hollywood can take care of the uh, heroic stories and, and then uh, literature has to offer something else. But also I, I think it is, uh, especially now when we are thinking about the, uh, how, how much actually uh, all kind of problems that democratic system is uh, facing at present, we need to, um, we need to understand also why, uh, how, how uh, authoritarian or totalitarian or dictatorships are actually operating. Uh, and um, we need to understand that system uh, to understand also why they still kind of exist. Um, and uh, why it might also be very difficult to get rid of that system. 
because you have to somehow operate with the system. You are, you are somehow participating in the system somehow. And, uh, and this is a moral dilemma. And moral dilemma is something that, um, that, that um, it does hurt you. It does hurt you. So, um, yeah. Yes, because um, Alide actually betrays her sister. Well, she's tortured and, and then she betrays her sister. But we learn in the novel that, you know, it has something to do with love also. She is in love with her sister's husband. And um, uh, in the end, she sets fire to, or she, no, she doesn't, but she says she's going to, or we, she is planning to set fire to her house and herself, and she's going to bury herself beside this, uh, uh, her, her sister's husband, who is buried uh, uh, underneath uh, the floor in her house. Um, so that seems to be the only solution for her, and is, is that purge in, in a way, is that purifying or what you call it, or getting rid of all this is just as to set fire to it all in the end, or? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure. Perhaps it was uh, the only solution for her, uh, and, and of course we, we can see that uh, fire is a purifying element. Um, so also there's symbolism uh, in, in that. But coming to terms with the past is a very complicated, uh, uh, complicated project. Uh, and um, it's like the truth, uh, but uh, that is the work yeah. we need to do. Need to be, it needs to be done. Yeah. But it's, it's almost like the truth uh, for her is some sort of punishment that she inflicts on herself in the end. Um, because the truth is impossible for her to live with, um, and, yeah. you, and you, and the novel ends with some documents, letters, and documents that actually show, you know, the context in which she has been living, or 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 why she betrayed yeah. uh, members of her family. Yeah. Um, yes. May maybe we should uh, move on to another subject that I have been. Um, well, others have been writing, writing about it, but it's very obvious, I think, in your novels, it's shame. People are ashamed of different things. They are ashamed of what they have done, for instance, like Alita, uh, what she has done in her past. Uh, but in um, Stalin Kaus, for instance, they are ashamed to show that they are Estonian, or, or at least the mother doesn't want her daughter to talk Estonian when she's in Finland and so forth. Um, can you say something about that with, with the shame? And this has also something to do with individuals and the bigger history. It's as if the bigger history or something in society makes people feel uh, ashamed. Well, um, being Estonian um, during the years of Finlandization um, in Finland was very tricky. Uh, the Finlandization was the political period uh, where oh, it, it is uh, a general term for political uh, system where a smaller state uh, has to uh, follow the recommendations of a bigger neighbor. Um, and um, it was a very tricky, tricky time for Finland um, and for official Finland, um, the Republic of Estonia, of course, didn't exist at the time. See, so the only good Estonian for Finland was a Soviet Estonian. Uh, and um, as, um, as our education system uh, in Finland also followed the Soviet recommendations, that meant that uh, the existence of Estonia, which before was a very good and close neighbor to Finland, we are very close, uh, um, disappeared. And new generations uh, started to think Estonia as part of Russia and Estonians as Russians as well. So uh, in, in that way, it was, um, and still uh, it's not, totally uncommon to be called a Russian, even though you, you are Estonian. Um, so 
And uh, of course, uh, Finland has a tricky, uh, co- uh, uh, tricky history with uh, Russia and Soviet Union uh, as well. But anyway, all this made it very complicated to be an Estonian in Finland at the time. And then when the borders were opened, um, there were a lot of Estonians uh, in Finland, that is definitely true, but uh, most of the headlines were about the Estonian prostitutes and Estonian criminals. So certainly the stereotypical Estonian was either a prostitute or a criminal. And of course now uh, the situation is better as there are also all kinds of other professions available uh, in Finland for Estonians and all Finns have a, some sort of personal connection somehow to Estonia. But uh, these, these stereotypes, uh, were, of course they were insulting for Estonians, uh, for sure, um, but these um, typical Eastern European uh, stereotypes about Eastern European people also in other uh, Western European countries. And when you think about uh, Hollywood or TV shows, for example, then uh, then uh, if you see in American movies or TV shows prostitutes, and if they are white, they usually do have a European uh, accent. That's true. Um, So um, when the mother, in in Stalin's cows, for instance, um, when the mother um, says to her daughter that she should not speak Estonian in Finland, it is actually to protect her. Uh, but it's, it's again this situation, what she does is wrong in one sense, but maybe right in another sense, and it's very difficult to do the right thing, perhaps. Uh, I think so, yes. And uh, when, when I think about my translations, then I've heard so many uh, similar stories from other minorities in many other countries, um, in the States, in Spain, um, for example, one of the most interesting uh, translations I've had is the Occitan translation of When the Doves Disappeared, this one which came, came in Occitan. And uh, Occitan is a minority language in France. And the stories that Occitan speakers told me uh, that it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough because they were punished uh, for speaking Occitan, for example. Uh, the children at school were not allowed to speak Occitan, which was where, uh, their first language. So in, in that way, this is, uh, these kind of stories are surprisingly, and sadly, they are very similar. And, and they're also the consequences or how it feels uh, is actually pretty, uh, pretty similar uh, in, in many countries. And... Um... And the way this conflict in the persons is expressed in the novels also um, is described by the way they treat their bodies. Um, for instance, Anna in Stalin's house, she's, she suffers from eating disorder. Um, Sarah, in, who is the grandniece of Alide in Purge, she, is, she has bruises and marks on the, all over her body. And um, well, baby Jane, there's also a lot about body and bodily mm. expressions and so forth. Um, what what has this to do with with the body? Are they are they communicating or what is this? Is this history sort of that? <laughs> I don't know what is in their bodies or, uh, or what, what is what is this with uh, well, their bodies? Uh, well, um, when I um, well, for example, Finland uh, is. Um, um, I, I mean, Finnish language is a uh, gender-free language, um, but we do see Finland as a maiden of Finland. And uh, in, in quite many countries, the nation is compared to a female body. Uh, and um, when I thought about this, uh, I started to think about the connection between a nation and a female body. Um, and uh, another idea I had in mind um, was that was um, how different genders express aggression. And it seems like that men are more prone to express their aggression towards the others. So they might beat someone up if they are, you know, losing their grip. But women, again, 
women are not taught to, uh, you know, uh, hit anyone. Uh, so women are hitting themselves in different forms. And I guess this is also one reason why actually eating disorders are more common uh, amongst women, more common amongst men as well nowadays. Um, but um, women are hurting themselves and men are hurting the bodies of the others. So there's def definitely a difference between how uh, different genders are expressing their aggression. Yes, and um, uh, something that may be attached to that is also, um, well, maybe when you write about these females, they are very much aware of which signals they send. Uh, for instance, the clothes they are wearing uh, um, when they are eating, um, every, you know, small little matters and items in their everyday life, um, they are very aware of what, what they mean and what they mean in Finland and that they mean something else in Estonia. So they have to change the way they behave and change their clothes when they cross the border. So, um, so this is well also connected to the, are they sort of, I mean, there's, there's silence and there's shame. There are a lot of things that they do not talk about and they are ashamed about a lot of things. But then again, there's something with their bodies and their clothes and so forth. Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, uh, when when I read about uh, read old classics, then uh, there's something that uh, started to bother me some time ago. And uh, even though there might be excellent novels, then there's surprisingly little information about the everyday life of the characters their hair or women's beauty might be described, but not actually uh, detailed in a way that a modern reader could actually understand it. Um, their clothing or fashion is not described very de uh, in a detailed manner. There might be a long passage of, uh, about the nature, for example, or trees or parks, but not actually about the everyday life or what's happening in kitchen, for example. And I think uh, this, uh, uh, this tells us about what has been considered important and everyday uh, chores, household chores, haven't been considered important. Or maybe the authors of the previous generations have have been you know middle class or upper class so they don't actually know how to cook or how to mend your clothes or or how to clean a pot for example so they haven't written about it they haven't been considered important enough to put it in art and yet when i think about you know the now the modern reader and now we are reading those novels which might be excellent novels but they don't actually tell what the life was all about. And they are leaving out a huge part of the everyday life. And I think uh, this is something I want to do differently uh, because when you try to see the life through the eyes of your character, then it's anyway the everyday life that actually matters. Uh, that every single person is anyway uh, spending a lot of time every single day for household chores, for example, um, unless you have so much money that you don't need to worry about them. But my characters are not like that. So I think the, so this is definitely uh, something I, I think it is important because I think everyday life and uh, household chores they can be also a platform to tell about the whole situation and the whole history. And um, I think this is also something that um, is important in a larger scale, like, you know, in the same way that uh, uh, feminists in 60s uh, started to remind people that personal is political, then I think everyday life and everyday chores, household chores, they are also political. Um, 
you mentioned Hollywood a couple of times uh, here, and in, in Hollywood there are always uh, happy endings, or almost mm -hmm. always. Yeah. Uh, and the solutions uh, seem very easy. Um, the bad guy explodes, and the others uh, are uh, celebrating. Um, and your novels, they are not very optimistic, you might say, or, or at least they are not, um, they are not uh, sort of straightforward. Um, both Purge and Stalin's Cows and so forth, they do not have happy endings. Um, and for instance, Alita, she has lived through communism, and then her grandniece Sarah, she lives through a brutal form of capitalism in Russia and in, also in Berlin, where she is a prostitute. Um, and it seems as if there's always someone's booth over your neck in your novels. Um, or there's something that you have to fight against or fight for. Um, is, is there no end or no real sort of solution to all these sufferings? Uh, well, I'm afraid populism uh, is popular because they are offering easy uh, easy answers, but life is not an easy, easy answer, and uh, to complicate it matters, there are no easy answers either. So in, in that way, I'm afraid I cannot offer easy, <laughs> easy endings. But on the other hand, um, when uh, in, in the novel, when the doves disappeared, um, quite many uh, readers have said that, oh, the ending is so sad, but um, I'm not sure if it's that sad because um, the novel ends in 60s when people didn't think that Estonia could regain the independency. Uh, people didn't believe that, but it did happen. And that is something that a modern reader knows. So we know that positive things did happen afterwards. Uh, so in that way, I don't need to, you know, uh, write that down in the novel. No. Um, but if you look at, at Purge, for instance, do you think it was, was liberation from communism a, a, a disappointment to many people in Estonia? Or, or how was it experienced uh, the years after the fall of, of communism? Well, uh, Estonia did fight for the uh, independence, regaining the independence. So I'm not sure if there's a single uh, Estonian uh, that was uh, sorry for the collapse of the system. Those who are uh, sad about that, I'm afraid they are living elsewhere. Of course, they are also, there's also a Russian-speaking minority, uh, which, uh, which might be, or especially the older ones, who got excellent benefits during the Soviet uh, uh, system. Uh, they might be sad for their benefits, um, but at the time... Uh, uh, but um, pre at the present, the Russian-speaking minority, minority has, uh, they have a higher salary in Estonia than they would have in, in Russia. So I don't think they want to move to Russia. They prefer staying in Estonia. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned um, your translations. Can you tell us a little bit about how your novels are being received elsewhere? I mean, you say something about Russia and Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Europe are, are there differences between the countries and are there? Definitely. You, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, um, what has been a huge and positive surprise to me is, of course, the uh, good reception in uh, countries where I wasn't expecting to to, to uh, get any readers. Uh, so, um, so um, I'm very happy about every single uh, translation and publication. Um, but uh, I have also learned a lot about the world with, with the help of my translations, because I have met so many different kind of readers, uh, people with uh, very bad. Uh, from mine or, or people who are living in distant countries. Um, and um, I've learned about the mechanisms of uh, oppression. And sadly, they, it seems to be pretty much the same, no matter what the system is. Um, I have a lot of readers in Latin American countries, for example. And... Um, and um, 
we di did connect well, I, I think, when I visited. So I was supposed to be in Colombia this year, but I wasn't, of course, thanks to the virus. Uh, but um, for example, Colum in Colombia, I wasn't expecting Colombian readers to be interested or in Mexico to be interested uh, about what's happening in Estonia or in Europe uh, either. But um, the stories of occupation and the stories of war and the consequences of war and coming to terms with the past, these uh, problems and con uh, problems connected to these uh, these matters, they feel very much the same uh, in Colombia and in Mexico and also in other Latin American countries. Also, the corruption is not that different in different countries. Uh, so, uh, in in that way. Uh, it seems like these, the, the stories of um, oppression, uh, occupation, uh, and totalitarian systems, they are pretty much the same all over the world. Um, and in your newest novel, uh, I haven't read it, but I've read about it. It's called The Dog Park. Yes. <laughs> yes, here uh, it is. <laughs> and, there, there's, <laughs> and there's something, there's something about the... Um, uh, this, this is just, just a remark, you don't have to answer this, just something that um, I noticed is that you have animals in many of your t titles. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stalin's cows and now uh, dog park and, uh, um, and dogs. Uh, and, um, but this newest novel is not about Estonia so much. It's, you are moving out of Estonia, so to speak, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, it's taking place uh, in Helsinki and in Ukraine, um, and um, uh, but uh, we do, do go to Estonia for a brief chapter. But otherwise, the the main focus is uh, in Ukrainian, and uh, I uh, made the decision about that when I was writing uh, the novel before the dog park called Norma, and. Um, which was a totally different kind of novel uh, than the dog park. Uh, but anyway, I came across some interesting facts about Ukraine. And I started to, th after that, I started to, to uh, think about focusing more on Ukraine um, for multiple reasons. Uh, one of them being that uh, you, if you want to write about corruption, then Ukraine is definitely a country to write about. Uh, corruption um, on, this, on that scale that it exists in Ukraine is somehow very complicated to understand from Nordic perspective. Because, of course, we do have our corruption scandals as well, but it's nothing compared to Ukraine. And um, I think corruption is very important. Um, subject matter to understand um, how it affects everyday life of people and how why it is so difficult to get rid of that then then um, that is something I wanted to write about and that's why I, I was focusing on, on Ukraine and also because Ukraine is, is one of those countries where you can see what happens if you cannot come to terms with the past, uh, because Ukraine has a very difficult history and uh, Ukrainian language has been oppressed so badly, it's heartbreaking. Um, but there have been these islands or islets of Soviet Union and they have, they existed until the revolution of 2014. Uh, I remember when I went the, to Ukraine around, uh, I, don't, I think it was 2009 or 2010, and I remember uh, experiencing so many flashbacks, like, you know, uh, walking into uh, Soviet Union, and then certainly on the other other corner there was totally modern uh, Ukraine. But then the, those islands of Soviet Union existed there, and um, they 
uh, they don't exist uh, anymore uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, that's what the revolution did and the war as well. But um, you could see that uh, Soviet Union was very much alive in, in those islands. And, and uh, so I wanted to write about the uh, long, uh, long shadow of totalitarian system. Uh, which and, and colonial, colonialism, uh, because I think colonialism, I, I consider myself a post colonial author, and, um, and the long traces of colonialism uh, is, is something we need to, need to also discuss when we talk about uh, totalitarian systems and dictatorships, because um, those traces are much, uh, I mean, they, they might have uh, consequences that really uh, affect the future. Yes, and we, well, at least I definitely look forward to, to, to read that novel, your newest novel. Um, there's something, you know, about, also, I mentioned these, these um, animals in your titles. Um, yeah. and they also um, tell a story in, in Stalin's cows. They are actually goats, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, they 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 are. Um, uh, it, uh, the title comes from a Soviet anecdote uh, because you know Stalin's propaganda was saying that uh, promising that Soviet Union has the biggest cows in the world. And when Estonians were deported to Siberia, Estonia, Estonians do have excellent cows, and Exto Estonian milk is excellent. They have very nice, uh, very nice grass for cows. Uh, but when Estonians were deported to Siberia, there were no cows, cows at all, only goats. So that's why they started to call the goats Stalin's cows. Um. Well, yes, uh, time is running for us. Um, I would like to, to ask you in the end, now you are here with us um, online uh, from your, I don't know, living room or something in, in Helsinki. And, this um, is my writing spot, actually. Oh, your writing spot, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how, has, how has this uh, um, coronavirus affected your work? Because I, I read uh, interviews with some uh, writers who say that in the beginning it was very good because they were not traveling and they were not giving public uh, lectures or interviews, they were just writing. Uh, but now it had, last, had lasted for, for almost a year or something like that. How, how does this affect your routines? Are you disrupted or are you enjoying it? Well, I, I was uh, my uh, well. The dog park came out in Finland uh, last year, so this was this year. I was supposed to travel. I was supposed to travel the whole year for translations, uh, and uh, of course, I didn't. Um, I was supposed to fly to states the day after Trump said that Europeans are not welcome. So, um, uh, so. Um, it hasn't been nice. Um, uh, luck luckily, quite many of my translations are postponed until next year or the year after. Um, we'll see. I'm a bit skeptical if I can travel, at least not next spring, most likely. It doesn't look like that. At the of course, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I miss traveling a lot. Uh, I'm a traveling person. Um, but um, what I have... Uh, I have been trying to act be active online. Uh, I have been uh, sending a Corona kitchen, a bookish Corona kitchen, uh, uh, live uh, streaming live from from the kitchen and talking about books and and trying to be active on social uh, media. Uh, and I would love to be actually even more active, um, but this fall has been very busy with other online activities, so I haven't been able to be as active as I wanted to be on live, on my personal online, but I've been active online <laughs> otherwise. Um, but all this distance, distance working as such, is pretty normal for an author because you write your books in solitude. So in that way, social distancing is not a problem to me, uh, at least. Uh, 
maybe they are more social authors. But of course, uh, well, I'm very uh, sad that I cannot, you know, meet readers because most of the work I do is anyway done alone or only I'm accompanied um, by my characters, but not like, you know, uh, living persons in, in flesh and blood. Um, but so it, it's, it's tough. And of course, I worry about the culture feed in general, because the, what kind of economic consequences we are going to see, I don't know, but it's not going to be good. And the people working for theater, music, it's even worse. It's not good for book industry either, but it's horrible. It's horrible for everybody. Yeah. Yes, and, and um, of course we would like to have you here in, in person in Flesh and Blood today too, but we are very uh, grateful that you could be with us from Helsinki. So, um, thank you very much, Sofie Oksanen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do hope to see you in real life, you know, because I wanted to visit the islands. I love islands. I'm an island person, so um, I trust I can see your beautiful islands. We must After. be sure to invite you, yes, again. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Bye. <clears throat>